you're sitting down, you're trying to figure out how similar the profiles are. Well, we can do that whole process in 48 hours because we just say, okay, the objective for the AI is to match the flavor um, and sensory profile of this prior vintage. You're listening to the Vint Podcast, bringing you expert interviews, alternative market insights, and exclusive access to the world of wine and spirits investing. Enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Vint Podcast. My name is Brady. I'm joined once again in studio by Billy Galenko. Billy, how are you? Doing well. Despite your your not wanting to, we're going to note that this is a pre-recorded episode because I'm in France right now when you're That's listening right. to this. Yeah. You're in France. I am, um, well, I'm where I always am. And uh, we did two episodes this week, but our listeners are just getting this one. So we we're really excited to get this episode out to folks. Um, one of our uh, only episodes on kind of the intersection of wine and technology uh, that we've done like within the wine industry. So really excited for this interview. Yeah, you you randomly I don't know how you found these folks, um, but the guy people at Tastery um, we interviewed Katarina, who is a, the driving force behind there, and she it was really interesting. Um, I didn't really know much about it before researching for this um, podcast but coming out of working for multiple producers um both like my producer in australia focused on both large and small volume wines so like we were doing some bulk that was shipped all over the world as well as you know individual brands and then um my cup the producer i worked for here also kind of was straddling the balance they had some estate wines i was on those but they also had some bulk and it was just so interesting to, to hear about this this tool that kind of would have drastically helped my job both times. Yeah, it was actually Andrew Nelson at War Room and uh, Bonnie Dune who put us in touch uh, with Tastry um, and with Katarina, who we interviewed today. Um, yeah, su super exciting technology, kind of bringing machine learning to uh, decision making around um, how to blend wines, what decisions to make um, in the winery that will resonate with consumers. Um, sounds like Tastry um, has generated a ton of value for producers and re retailers and kind of, yeah, fits right in with kind of this vision for the podcast of wine to give people insight into all corners of the industry. I think we did that yeah. today. Oh, I think the other the other interesting part is we, we're, we're leaning heavily, like at least I was talking about the, like, you know, for producers and how it can help people make better wine. But I think it goes back to something that kind of like would vent the purpose of our company kind of does is like we saw saw a problem in the wine industry and we wanted to you know give more people access to the top wines in the world and how to participate they basically were like people are making wines based off ideas that they think people are going to like but they really don't have any idea it's kind of this top down thing where experts are saying well people should like this and it's going that way or they're just watching what's selling and going with that rather than actually talking to the people. So like they're, it's so interesting that their machine learning model really started from the people up and they're helping better understand the folks and it's ending in a better wine in theory for everybody. Yeah, that's right. I mean, producers hopefully make more money, retailers make more money and consumers get wines that they're excited about more often. So I think that, yeah, it's definitely a win all around. Yeah, no, I think like that's people's biggest fear is they get the same wine over and over because they're worried that they're not going to like it. Well, if they had a little bit more assurance that they might, that would be great. Because like, you know, if somebody like me with, you know, enough experience, I can read the back of the bottle, I can do a little bit of this and that, look at the text sheet and get a general idea. And I like to get a different bottle every time. I rarely get the same wine over and over. Um, and I always encourage other people to do that. And then I never really try to have the empathy to understand like, ah, oh, you're just, you're lame. You get the same wine. It's like, well, no, you don't, they don't know exactly how. And it's like, you don't want to pay 15, 20 bucks, come home with something you don't like. Um, or even, you know, even if it's only five or $10. So I think that's, it's kind of cool to figure out how they're, they're kind of mapping and helping people know before it even hits the shelves that people in that area are going to probably like these wines. Yeah. And there's so much talk around um, AI and like learning models and, and in this case like machine learning um, so I think it definitely fits too into sort of this technology moment of letting computers and like data sets uh, smart data sets do 
some of the heavy lifting for us. And so I think the wine industry is in need of some of that lev heavy lifting be taken off her shoulders. All right. I have a random question for you based on some of the things she was noting. So she was something that I thought was really cool is she was basically saying like what you, you were eating when you were growing up or what you're generally accustomed yep. to liking on a macro scale kind of drives trends in your areas. She made the really cool um, point that, you know, wine with smoke taint is actually weirdly more widely enjoyed or accepted in Texas because of yeah. everybody's inherent love of barbecue, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> um, so my question for you is what would the Maryland flavor profile lean towards? Is it like old Bay in wine or like what, what is it? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I guess there are a couple of different ways could go. Um, something that we do here that I don't know how many other places do this, but this kind of idea of like fat and acid balance together happens a lot, especially like in like the like central East Coast and down to the Carolinas, right? Like the barbecue sauce in the Carolinas, uh, or the, you know, kind of is all vinegar based. Um, have always like really liked vinegar. We eat vinegar on French fries um, up here with usually sprinkle like Old Bay on it too with French fries. Um, and so I think that like acidity like resonates with me, uh, just like personally. Well, what if you know. think what what have you seen? Like what what would you think your friends and family in the area? Is uh, there something that they really grab? Yeah, like what are, what are the average Marylanders or the I don't know where you live in Maryland, but yeah, your town. Um, well, okay, okay. Um, people that I know out where I live, which is like farther out in where I grew up, was farther out in the country, and people definitely have like a sweeter palate overall for certain things. So does I'll, that go with the food you would eat too? Like maybe just like really like kind of you know meat and potatoes heavy kind of like yeah just like heavy um, a diet of those things that are like starchy and rich and uh, maybe sweet as well. Then I'm also thinking about kind of as you head more towards the city and the coast, you get, you know, people are eating more seafood, drinking more beer. You know, Baltimore is a huge beer town. Um, so I think about, you know, some of the, I, we've talked on other episodes about wines that resonate with beer drinkers. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that like also maybe would play, play a factor as well. Um, yeah, that's a tough question to answer, but one that I think Tastry, this company does sounds like really well. Yeah, I like how she's like we're trying to predict more of what people don't know they like yet and will like. And I think so what you got to at the very end there, I think makes a lot of sense with like seafood, whether it be fried or even like boiled crabs, a, a crisp beer with some bubbles is always a sure. great pairing. Yeah. So maybe, you know, yeah. that helps drive a big beer market. Maybe a lighter like Piquet or some sparkling wine or something down the line could maybe fill that void or something, you know, natty. Um, yeah, I was well, thinking it's funny because like, maybe the most the most successful in my uh, in my view, like I mean, I don't have their balance sheets, but uh, sort of the best received winery in the state, Westminster Old Westminster Winery, makes wines exactly in that style. I think that like for me would really resonate with a light beer drinker, or even like craft beer drinker who maybe drinks like sours or or like kind of lighter beers, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about her too because she was. She mentioned, and I, I bring it up on the podcast, like, oh, some a lot of the the biggest hits in your area or even across the country just happen spontaneously. And my old company, the one of the their main products, I guess the main thing that drives the revenue that allowed their estate division to be created was this Stella Rosa wine, which is like a it's kind of like a Moscato di Assi. It basically is a base, and then there are flavors, so it's like sparkling and slightly sweet. But it took off because. The winery, the original winery, is based on the east side here in L.A., and there's a large Hispanic community that was actually in the neighborhood, and they would say people would just come over and you know, grab a bottle, and that works really well, particularly like with tacos, things that are like kind of spicy mm. but also fatty and stuff, um, sure. and it really played in with that, and I was like, hmm, may maybe that does make sense, and then turns out Americans overall just eat a lot of either fatty or some spicy things, and that kind of just took off. Um, I, I think that's... That's interesting. It would be interesting to have a technology to help find some of these unique things a little sooner and see what we can have. I think it's going to lead to a bit of innovation in the market for sure. Yeah, I remember I think this past summer, like my mom never drinks anything with bubbles. She just like immediately is like crinkles her nose and just like hates the sparkling aspect. 
I got her to drink a, um, like, slightly effervescent Lambrusco, uh, like, off, a bit off dry, um, but she loved it. I, like, never would have thought that she would drink something like that. It was kind of just, like, poured into a solo cup, like, on the deck around the pool kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think that it shows that a bunch of different things that people don't expect that they would, like, can resonate if it's, you know. Yeah, so if they have the assurance, whether it be from a technology or a trusted retailer that was informed yep. by Tastery, maybe they'll be more open. So that's that's my mission is always to have people try more wines and, and Tastery is helping do that. So I'm in. I like them. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, our interview uh, today is with Katarina Axelson, who's the CEO and founder of Tastery. Uh, she graduated from Cal Poly. She has her bachelor's in chemistry. Um, she worked at a custom crush facility and um, kind of industry adjacent, also in the lab, uh, working with uh, some producers and really kind of latched on to this issue that a lot of these decisions were being made blindly uh, and just making a lot of assumptions about what consumers liked or didn't like. So she taught, as she says, a computer how to taste and um, tastry is the result of that. It sounds like um, they're innovating a lot of really cool ways and, and it was great to have her on. So without further ado, here is our interview with Katerina. Hey, Katerina, thanks for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we haven't, I think maybe I talked to you a little bit um, in our, on our initial call that we, we haven't had too many people in the kind of technology space adjacent to the wine industry, so it's really um, exciting to have you on today and hopefully talk about Tastry and what you guys are doing there, but also just about technology in the wine industry in general. Um, you're certainly doing something unique there. Yeah, thank you. I think it's about time we inject some technology into the wine industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we'll start there. Like the, the industry is pretty antiquated, right? And um, so I'm sure you got your start somewhere and sort of noticed this and wanted to implement a solution. So can you maybe talk about your background a bit, how you got into the wine space, the wine industry, and then yeah. ultimately what led you to Tastry? And then we, we can go more in depth there, but start. The yeah, it, I feel like everyone who ends up in the wine industry has some interesting story as to how they ended up there. But um, I went to Cal Poly University in the central coast of California. And um, I was an aspiring scientist, but, you know, I, you know, I was studying chemistry, but, you know, we have 400 wineries in a 40 mile radius or something like that around here. So the way I paid my way through college was by working at various wineries, large productions mostly. Um, and I would be in the lab and, and, you know, do the other jobs. And I worked in this industry quite a while. Um, mostly in the lab, but, you know, I was young and optimistic and ambitious, and you work in any industry long enough, you start to see, you know, the idiosyncrasies or, you know, dark sides of that industry, and the wine industry is no different, and so I would observe that we would be making multi-million dollar, you know, batches of wine, multi-year decisions, and things would happen like we would put the same wine under different labels and then it would go out in the market and receive different scores from the same critics. And, you know, it wasn't very objective or transparent. But I think the most interesting thing I noticed is that um, it's very important that you make a wine a certain way. It has a certain quality. It has certain aromas. And it's a very big decision. It costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time involves a lot of people and it's all based on intuition and everyone's trying everyone's looking at Nielsen you know scan data and trying to figure out oh how do I emulate or differentiate against my competitors how do I know what the consumers are going to want are they still going to want it you know by the time the wine is out and their best you know way to answer these questions was to sit in a room and sniff some wine and say oh, I think it needs to be more tropical, right? There's a artistic um, component here, but usually the sophisticated palates and preference of the people making the wine, um, you know, isn't what the majority of consumers are drinking. Um, unless it's, you know, a very high-end cult-like wine. So anyway, that was like a 
very, uh, sorry, long tangent, but like I thought at the time, okay, what if I can just objectify all of this? And what if we can understand more about what consumers want, even though they can't describe it by looking at the chemistry? And the answers we want have to be in the chemistry because we're experiencing it. The problem is we're looking at chemistry like a machine would, and we should be looking, we should be teaching the machine to look at chemistry the way a human would. So that was like the big hypothesis and like, but like part of the key problems, um, if I could just explain for a few minutes is, uh, you know, I read research on how people perceive flavors and we actually don't really understand that really well. So even like multi-billion dollar CPG companies will spend money on focus groups and pour, you know, coffee or whatever product it may be. Um, and uh, half the people will come back and say, oh, this is, you know, apple, and the other half will say this is pear, because we have different experiences. And um, we actually found flavors and what you perceive don't even predict how much you like the product. So if you want a successful product like wine, it's all about consumers just having a positive experience and remembering that it's not about it, you know, tasting like cherry or anything like that. But the problem was, is no one could really figure out how to do that because there's a flavor matrix effect in the chemistry. So everyone's looking for, okay, how do I make this taste like cherry? But the problem is, is looking at that one compound is irrelevant because there's hundreds of other compounds interacting that are like a chemical soup. And um, it, it's about looking everything in one snapshot. So the short version is, you know, after years of research with analytical and flavor chemists and um, machine learning experts, we actually developed a method that could look at the entire flavor matrix of a wine in one snapshot, um, the same way a human palate would. Um, and that's how we kind of like objectify um, this process and then relate it to what consumers actually like. Yeah, I think that's, that's so interesting to me. I, I worked a vintage um, in Australia at a larger winery, and um, I don't think people realize that, you know, there's all this romance and everything around wine, and everybody's like, oh, it's kind of, to your point, this subjective thing where the, the winemaker goes out into the vineyard and tastes with the, the vineyard manager, and then it just becomes wine. It's like there's, most of the people really want their wine that they get, you know, in large volume to taste the same way every time. Um, and they don't think about how that comes to be. They think it's like this romantic, you know, process. And I think what you're saying is really interesting to like kind of help streamline that and and make it a little bit more consistent. We we used to have a, our winemaker would drive from Adelaide like three hours just to come taste and like look at the lab report and then be like, do these two little things. And then he would go back away. Like we could have saved money for the end consumer if we didn't have him just do that drive every day just to taste, you know, 50 tanks. So... I think your process is really interesting. And yeah, and I, I know we haven't gotten into it yet, but that's actually, it's a really good point. You know, um, one of the more interesting things about Tastry is it's not just about, you know, mitigating the risk of launching a wine that consumers are not going to like, right? It's not, it's not, it, I mean, we do help make the best wine ever, the best wine you possibly can with the resources you have when we do that very quickly. But where you see the more tangible benefits immediately is like the savings and operational costs because um, you get to the result you want faster, right? So like one thing we do is like oak trials, right? That could take switching over from cooperage to staves or alternatives, right? Um, that could be a very long process because you're running trials, you're, um, you're trying diff from different vendors, you're sitting down, you're trying to figure out how similar the profiles are. Well, we can do that whole process in 48 hours because we just say, okay, the objective for the AI is to match the flavor um, and sensory profile of this prior vintage. Here's the material that is possible or you know could be part of the recipe and then it gets to that point a lot more quickly with the less trial and error does i guess you can explain a little bit more how yeah. tastry works but I, I would say like one question is for when you you're running these lab reports it's doing its matrix does it give out specific quantities for like adjustments or like tweaks based on like say what you have available like you know does it say this much acid or 
you know, five bags of staves? Like how, how, yeah. how does it denote the tweaks to make? Yeah, so it's called computational blending. And what we do is um, it's kind of a brute force method. So uh, the other side of Tastry is, is we have provided wine recommendations to consumers, right, for many years. And we have our own training sets that help us understand how much consumers like something. So basically, we have all these human palettes we have gathered, which I could explain how we do that in like the cloud. And we call it the virtual focus group. And we run all possible simulations of chemistries of wine that don't even necessarily exist yet. So over the years, you know, in our software, we've analyzed, you know, um, adjuncts from all sorts of providers, for example. And we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of wine chemistry profiles. So what it's doing is it's it's figuring out what is the relationship in that flavor matrix when you add this oak or, you know, this acid or whatever it may be. And then it runs it against consumer, hypothetical consumer reactions to that product virtually. And then it comes back with the best possible outcomes and the recipe for those outcomes. So yes, it does give you specific quantities based on like what you're looking for and what you're targeting. Yes, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Maybe you can, let's take a step back and talk about specifically like what is Tastry? Um, who is the customer uh, for your guys' product? Uh, yeah. And what does it actually look like uh, when you, you know, someone agrees to, to work with you and what, what service do you guys provide? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I dived right in there. <laughs> yeah, um, so, you know, our, our slogan is we taught a computer how to taste. We are vertically integrated. So we work with the, pretty much the entire supply chain. We don't charge the consumer anything, but we, we felt it was important to work with retailers, brands, and now distributors because everyone wants everyone in the supply chain wants visibility on what the consumer wants, and they want it as quickly as possible. And the way we're able to do that is we developed these two proprietary data sets that I mentioned. So we have one is on the flavor matrix of wine and one is on the palates of consumers. So when we combine those two things, they mean the value of that data is different depending on who you're talking to, but they're, they're all running simulations with it on our software, if that makes sense. So when we work with a retailer, they're plugging into our intelligence to provide personalized recommendations to customers, which helps them engage clients, increase sales. But when they get enough customer um, preference data, now what they have is a tool to understand what they should be putting on the shelves to reduce waste. So we can look at their inventory and we can tell them X percent of consumers are going to like this wine and buy it again. So you should order more of this. And these SKUs are not selling because you know, X, Y, Z, possibly the palette match isn't great, but we can tell you what should be replacing those SKUs to drive repeat purchase. And then, um, you know, on the winery side, they do use the same customer data, but again, they're using it to understand, um, you know, how to make exactly what they want, what their goal is, um, you know, faster and better and cheaper. Um, and sometimes now that we have kind of like traction on both sides of the supply chain and we're helping the supply chain understand what consumers want even before it's happened, um, we're becoming a bit of a marketplace where um, we have relationships with retailers and category buyers and we have relationships with the brands and they're sending data showing that they should be stocking their product because it's going to match better with their consumers compared to their leading um, brand in that category, for example. So it, it gets really complex really quickly, but just, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about anticipating what the consumer trends are um, and, and avoiding any customer having a bad experience, whether you're a retailer or brand. You can, can you talk about just how you build those consumer profiles briefly? Um, like, is it a survey that someone fills out and say, 
you know, I like this flavor over, over that, or are they actually tasting something, you know, how, how does that profile get built? Yeah, actually, um, I'm going to try to not nerd out too much about this, but there's like a, a critical component here, and it's what differentiates Tastry from other companies, um, and we feel very strongly about it. So um, we have a way to understand consumers in a scalable fashion, right? Um, we can't run $100,000 tasting panels every time we want to understand a wine. There has to be a more efficient method. So what we did is we found a way to bypass the tasting process with, um, you could say, a deceptively whimsical looking quiz. And one thing I would note that we had to fight for a long time is um, the fact that, like, you know, some e-commerce companies have come out with gimmicky marketing tools that look almost exactly like this, right? Um, but in this case, this palette profiler quiz is tied to the underlying chemistry, and that's, I would say, the biggest differentiator. So the way we, the way the the science works here, just real quick, is we analyze the chemistry of the wines using our break down the flavor matrix method, right? And then we, over the years, um, poured thousands of blind, double blind tastings to thousands and thousands of consumers. We had tested the chemistry of those wines. Those consumers, uh, in, in the research, we were incredibly focused on how much they liked something, not what flavors or anything like that they perceived. So we got like a very breath, you know, a large breadth and depth of data to train our algorithms. But the key thing that made this scalable was as they were doing these tastings at the same time, they were answering hundreds of these analog questions for their preferences for things that had nothing to do with wine. So like, do you like black coffee or licorice or dark chocolate or Pellegrino? And so at the end of the trials, we had the consumers rating for the wines, the chemistry of the wines and their answers to these questions. And we used uh, machine learning algorithms to understand the relationship between their preferences for the flavor matrices in those foods and how they relate to their preferences for the flavor matrices in the wine. And that's how we came up with, hey, in 45 seconds and 20 questions, we can understand about, you know, 85% of your palate with no, that's as a starting point, with no other knowledge or feedback or ratings on any other wines you've ever had in the past. And that quiz is can be deployed, you know, to millions and millions of people overnight. Um, so basically... Um, I can stop talking, but I could kind of explain how this gives yeah. us an understanding of the United States um, and like the heat map of preferences right. of the United States. But that's how we started it. Yeah. So it sounds like you've found a way to more or less with a, sounds like a pretty high degree of accuracy bypass the issue that you maybe described at the onset was, you know, I like a wine because it tastes like cherry. And Billy likes the same wine, but he says, well, I don't, there's no cherry. I like it because it tastes like pear. Like that's not super helpful for developing these models, right? But the fact that we both like it is, right? And so have you, is that, am I describing it the right way in that you bypass some of that subjective, uh, what does this taste like and zoned in on yeah. some of the actual chemistry that makes you thumb, thumbs down? I mean, that, that's exactly right. That's kind of what blew my mind when we started this process is, I, you know, we were talking to multi-billion dollar companies that were doing research and they were focused on what flavors consumers perceive. But you know that it doesn't actually help drive repeat purchase because A, consumers don't really know what they perceive really. Um, and I'm not talking about extra, expert wine drinkers. I'm talking about the general population. And it doesn't really um, affect their preference, right? So why is everyone focused on the characteristics when they be, should be focused on understanding the, what the consumer actually likes better? So like, you know, I'm drinking this coffee right now. Um, I'm not going to buy it because I thought, oh, you know, it, it, I think I got a hint of cherry. I'm going to buy it again because I, I simply made the decision that it tasted good and I think it will taste good if I buy it again. And surprisingly, there's very little um, research and understanding on that. Now, I love the, the bottom up approach rather than the top down, rather than an expert saying this is what's in it, you know, going from your angle and saying, like, do you like it? Doesn't really matter why necessarily here's some other things you like 
Um, also, I'm thinking about either Maryland pears or cherries. How I don't know how Brady and I would consider. That would be hilarious, Brady. I just like how you're like, if I taste pear and you taste cherry, <laughs> oh, yeah. don't know what you're eating out there. But um, <laughs> um, I would love to hear more about the heat maps. I was actually just down at, um, so I live in LA. I was at a family event in Florida. And there's, you know, just looking at the the wines on the shelves there and, and even where I grew up in Virginia, they're, they're completely different everywhere. I'd love to hear a little bit about what you guys have found in, in heat maps, maybe just on like a broad scale so you guys don't give away any any secret sauce, but. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, so there, there are trends and big cities are more predictable, just statistically, right? Um, I, I, I can't come out and tell you things like, like it's, it's usually difficult to make very broad generalizations. Like, oh, people in Texas like things that are sweeter. It gets a lot more granular when you look at the data hmm. um, this way. Um, but there are trends in zip codes, and what I will hint at is the demographics um, aren't as uh, valuable as people think they are. Um, if that makes sense, it's all about culture, and mm -hmm. um, it's it, there's a lot more nurture. There's some nature for sure, like people have biological preferences, but there's a nurture component. And uh, I'll give you an example. Um, let's say, you know, there's a city or zip code where there are a lot of, you know, Japanese people. Um, some of them were immigrants and some of them, you know, grew up and, you know, were born here and they were eating burgers and milkshakes and, you know, that's how they grew up. The people who came directly from Japan were eating, you know, natto and, and like Japanese food. Even though their biological preferences might be similar, um, the cultural um, effect on their palate um, is dramatic. So what you grew up eating affects your preferences way more than what demographic you're in, um, which is where the quiz is very helpful in, in understanding that because it gives you a better idea on what your actual current cultural preferences are, if that makes sense. That's really cool. Um, I, the something that I, I thought about when when we first talked was, you know, who who else in the space is taking a, a stab at this? It sounds like you guys are maybe the first to um, approach this issue um, using machine learning. Is that right or or not right? And who maybe are other kind of not competitors, but are there other companies thinking about the problem from the same angle that you guys are? I think there are companies that are trying to understand the science of, you know, product development and winemaking. And our opinion is there are a lot of um, shortcuts there. And I think a lot of people didn't take our approach um, because it maybe it was too novel. Um, it's very difficult for me to point to like a direct competitor. Um, our business model is complex yeah. and it's new. The technology, you know, is an entirely different approach than the way things are done now. But there are companies that have, um, you know, looked at the chemistry of beer, for example. And what they did is they relied on experts for the training set, which we think is not a good way to go, but the experts were identifying these flavors and characteristics like we were describing. So how hoppy or how fruity is this beer, for example. And then what they would use, I wouldn't call it AI, but let's say algorithms, is they would test, analyze the chemistry of a new beer and try to identify, okay, how, how hoppy or fruity is it? Um, and it's that's different from what we do because that's that's very quality like control, right? Um, and it's not about generating new things or understanding what could have been if you don't have done this. It's not it's not good at um, simulating better outcomes for the future. Um, if that makes sense. yeah, that's kind of how I meant to say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Um, so think thinking about that, who is your ideal customer within the wine industry? Um, well, is it, you know, I guess you said producers, also retailers, but you know, really where does a technology like this deploy most seamlessly? 
Yeah, I would say, so we have customers of all sizes, but we'll definitely lean toward larger productions, definitely above 50,000 cases. We have done some, you know, we've done some incredible things with very, very small productions, like in the event of an emergency or if they wanted to understand, you know, the opportunity for their product better. But the reason that um, we leaned into larger productions is there's a lot of opportunity to um, improve the efficiency um, and how the, the products I made, right? They're, these are like large scale factories and it's about the economics and it's about the unit costs. And um, that's, you're, it's very easy to prove value there with a large production. Um, also, they are often, more often than not, nationally distributed, which means that they can more likely leverage our um, data and understanding on how to get more business in retail. Um, not to say we haven't got, we've definitely gotten very small brands and, you know, placements in like Costco and Kroger and places like that. Um, it just takes more time for them to wrap their head around it, I think. I have two ran, I guess, two disparate questions. So I'll leave. The first one is what happens, say, down the line, five, 10 years, 20, everybody's using your guys' technology and you've identified like, this is the optimal one. How does a brand continue to differentiate from each other? Are they going to have like programmed house versions of this or like how, how, how will you guys continue to facilitate in a world like that? Okay. So I hope I am understanding your question. And if I am, we get this, we used to get this question all the time, which was, you know, if, if your AI is optimizing the wine, doesn't that mean everyone's going to be drinking apothic red, right? Or something like that. Um, and the answer is it's actually the opposite. Um, right now, like before Tastry, we, I mean, when we first started working with clients, they were already trying to do that. Everyone's trying to make a look alike of X, Y, or Z, right? Like they don't need our help for that. Um, the interesting thing is, is, uh, they're doing that because it feels safe, right? Like you want the golden goose, you don't want to mess with the golden goose. But it's it's ironic because the most successful labels and brands that have come out were way more often just done on a whim, a creative whim by a winemaker who really just wanted to have the balls to do what he wants to do. Um, so our data shows why make apothic red, for example, when you could make something so much better. The problem with making the best wine possible for everyone is you get water, right? So you can't do that. It's actually, it's not possible. You're going to, the more people like it, the less those people will like it, if that kind of makes sense. And the fewer people like something, the more they're likely to like something. So if you see an opportunity for the materials and resources you have, to do something different that hits a different niche or group of people stronger, you're going to be more successful. So it's we've done, gone through a couple cycles and we've seen that we're actually encouraging more diversity in the kind of wines that are coming out in the market because people have the reassurance, they're looking at data and it's giving them reassurance to do something new instead of going stale. Hmm, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, it's actually, I used to work at the um, the winery. I was on the estate side of things, but the winery that created Stella Rosa, and that was basically one of their their founders did that on a whim. And we've seen how that's taken off across the U.S. So it's kind of funny. It really matches exactly what you're saying. Um, my my follow up question was utilizing your technology. Obviously, you guys are able to break down and analyze wines. Is there a plan? And what would it look like to provide wine ratings that are, you know, completely objective and you're no longer relying on a James Suckling or a Robert Parker who may have completely different ideas of what's good? Um, you mean how do you make tastry like the, the scoring system of the future kind of? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Like how, how have you guys thought about that and like what would you envision it looking like if you did? Yeah, well, I, you know, the future is beyond personalized, right? Everyone wants to feel like they are catered to as an individual when they are buying a product. So 
Um, our system does that really well. When you get a wine recommendation from us, we're telling you, okay, this wine is going to be, you know, a 92% match to you and an 85% match to your wife. And so, um, you know, you, you know what I mean? It, 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 the rating is different depending on who you are. So it's not based on a score from a critic um, who has certain followings. Um, the, the vision is, you know, people are less and less willing to risk $15, $20 without the reassurance that they're going to like the product. So I would say five years from now, um, whatever sensory based product it is, even beyond wine, people will think, it would be very unlikely for you to buy something without kind of like the green check mark that says, yes, this is a match for you. Um, it would, yeah. everything runs through Tastry and you, you have reassurance before you make a purchase. I like that idea. It's like, what's a hundred for Billy is going to be different than a hundred for Brady. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and so you said five years from now, um, is there is there a consumer component to this? Is there like an app or something where, like you're describing, Billy, Billy or I could get a score and like profile for certain wines that quote unquote match? Our yeah, palette? let me check if we if our personal app is out. I mean, on our website, anyone can get their palette profiled. But what our strategy was to do was just to plug into existing customer bases. So. Tastry as a company, as a team, has always been a very strong tech team. Um, and we didn't want to kind of risk, you know, at our early stage, um, investing millions of dollars in acquiring a customer base to just be a recommender engine. So what we did is we partnered with retailers and it became a powered by Tastry model. So we were um, our recommenders on Dana Ghosh, for example. So um, you go on there, Dana Ghosh is using the intelligence of this. Um, and recommending their inventory to their customers using Tastry. And then we get that consumer data and populate our database and give them back interesting insights. So it's a powered by Tastry model. Um, we just, we plug into apps and um, retailers and e-retailers. And I guess the other, I guess the, the big provider of this kind of, what fits your palate um, uh, service is Vivino. Mm -hmm. maybe the uh, marketplace site and app who, you know, kind of has their recommended for you uh, things based off of how you rate a wine or previous wines that you've tasted, which is why you're supposed to log them all. Um, I, you know, maybe I never got to a place where I had logged enough wines in the app, but I, I didn't feel like it was super accurate at all times. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm a big Vivino fan in general, but, you know, would be curious to use your guys' recommender as well. Yeah, let me send you a link and we'll make it happen. You know, the other thing about rec recommenders like that is um, they use more often than not what's called collaborative filtering. And our opinion is it kind of makes recommendations boring um, over time because yeah. not, not to say that it, it's not helpful. <laughs> um, I don't mean to sound too aggressive, but if your algorithms are focused on finding wines or products that are similar to the ones you've already liked or um, similar to people similar to you, right? Um, you're just like, let's say you rated a bunch of Syrahs very highly. It's gonna be recommending a bunch of Syrahs to you, but some days you might like a Pinot, there might be a Zin you might like, there might be a cab you might appreciate one day. This is just like a high level example, right? So if you want more interesting recommendations, you don't want to kind of get stuck in that rut. You want something that understands sure. your palette, not just a snapshot of patterns you've engaged in. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think I tend to agree too. I, I think there's definitely some limits to those kinds um, of models and, and usually I'd advise people not to you know, I think everyone's always looking for, you know, what is the grape that I like? What is the style that I like? Um, and just like you're saying, I mean, that can change day to day. And, you know, maybe the style of a certain grape just like wasn't made in a style that you like. So you can't write that grape, uh, that particular variety off. Um, we, we all know that, you know, wine's a little bit more complex than that. Um, it, let's let's talk about the industry a little bit and just technology in the industry. Why why do you think the wine industry in general is so slow moving 
to adopt new technologies and things like that. Um, assuming, you know, maybe at the onset that, you know, it's because of a risk aversion, right? It's a super capital intensive business. And so there's little margin maybe for some of that risk taking, but are there any other factors that maybe contribute to lack of adoption to some emerging technologies? Well, um, I think, I think so. I think, um, you know, wine has been made a certain way for thousands of years. And a lot of, um, you know, winemakers have been successful in doing what they're doing for decades. So, you know, using another tool, even if it does make your life easier, it takes time, right? Um, I, I don't think that's unique to the wine industry, um, but it, it is a particularly different, difficult industry to break technology into. Um, I'm trying to think of other reasons, but um, what I could say how we overcame it is when we launched Tastry, we started talking to clients about solving their biggest problems and emergencies. Um, so, uh, y you know, if, if you had to save this production or you say everything was affected by smoke taint or something crazy like that, um, we would say, okay, great, give us a stab at it. And then we would come back with really good results in 48 hours. And, you know, we would save clients millions of dollars. And that did a couple of things for us. One, it got them on the platform and it got them engaged very quickly because they're doing something serious. They're solving a real problem, right? Um, but once you're on the platform, you become more ca comfortable and you, it becomes more of a habit. That makes sense. Have you, have you seen any, so I'm kind of like going, thinking about this also through like, um, more of that romantic wine nerd side of things. Maybe it's a producer who doesn't want to change necessarily the way they're making their wine. They've always done it. They want to do lower intervention. They're like, you know, a higher end, like you said earlier, maybe a cult producer. Have they asked you to use your technology to identify, um, like notes of the terroir? Or like what does set apart our wine? Is anybody trying to use it as like marketing fodder being like, we have this special thing that nobody else has around us in our wine. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to think about that one. Um, I, I mean, we have a lot of winemakers who have told their story and their experience with Tastry on our website, but marketing fodder, I'm not sure. I, I maybe I didn't understand the question. Sorry. Yeah. I, I guess like, yeah, no, it's kind of, I'm still forming it in my head. Um, I'm just thinking of somebody like, picture will go all the way to the top, like Domaine de la Romani Conti, like DRC, everybody mm -hmm. claims it's the best, they're making enough money, so they want to be like, we want to get our wines, and they, they would never do this, but or maybe they would, but they want to get their wines, wines analyzed to show like these distinct components make DRC mm -hmm. this much better than like a different one, um, yeah, and they're just yeah. like trying to prove it out. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think I get it. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say cult brands like that. Um, but that's exactly how our clients, um, work with retailers, right? Is they will say my wine is better in these characteristics and consumers therefore will like it this much better. Um, that is exactly what it's doing is, is identifying the best, um, elements of that wine from a consumer perspective using, science right um instead of subjective opinion so that's our clients a lot of them use us that way yeah that is correct another way um maybe a cult wine would use it we do work with some very high-end brands is as a seed bank so hmm. um you know if you had a very successful vintage and you we analyze that now we have that flavor profile to refer to with any future vintages when we could use it as a benchmark that makes yeah. sense rather than, I mean, some people do keep records, but now you have a very specific record. That makes, that makes sense. Um, Way more has anybody, I guess, yeah, I guess my other question was it, I'm, I'm still like kind of like a, not a purist, but going back to like the idea of terroir, what if somebody's like, I grow X on like this type of soil. So they do like a soil analysis and they get a wine out. Does that, has anybody tried to use that? in like using your technology to inform where to plant like the next vineyard, like, cool, if this is similar soil, I'll take a, a clone in theory, I should get similar wine out. I mean, obviously it's not um, that easy, but 
No, well, we're getting there. Right now, we're hyper-focused on post-secondary, uh, but we keep getting requests and pressure to move into the earlier side of the winemaking process, right? Going back to the vineyard, uh, mm -hmm. the farther back you go, the better the outcome. But we're just we're just not there yet. But we will be there. Um, I would say a couple years. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, I can imagine. I'm just. It's exciting. All the possibilities you have in my mind, just kind of like all over the place. What you could do with it. So. Yeah, we've had to be very disappointed. <laughs> Go ahead. No, yeah. Um, can, can you describe the, like, it? Is there an average palate profile for American wine drinkers that you could describe for us? Or is it more variable by, you know, specific demographic breakdowns or region of the country or, or something like that? Um, like, are there some descriptors that you can give for the types of wines that uh, we most like? Um, I'll, I'll give some fun, obvious examples, but there was a, you know, there's natural smoke taint compounds, for example, and um, grapes, and, like they exist even without fires. And um, our data, one of our clients was um, impacted and our data showed that the wine would do incredibly well in Texas because this, in this particular case, there was a very strong barbecue um, component. So we've seen like fun, obvious things like that. Um, I would say, you know, everyone likes to talk about how people like things on the sweeter side. Um, I think that's true. But um, what's interesting is they like it even when they don't perceive sweetness. Um, I know, I, I know people don't think they perceive sweetness when they do. But what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you add a certain amount of oak or there's a certain amount of alcohol or acid, you can hide the sugar and it won't t taste sweet at all. But people still rate those wines more highly because you get the sugar high in your brain, um, even if you don't mm. taste it. Um, so you're oh, getting wow. that hit of happiness from the sugar regardless of what you're experiencing and that's like a latent variable we had to figure out because our ai isn't looking at what hits your brain like that right wow. so are you are you seeing that so that, that makes me think of we have had a guest on recently peter leem who uh, is kind of like an expert in champagne and he had a similar experience where they would do bench trials for different dosage levels and he was like there's certain levels where either the, the sugar would stand out or you wouldn't perceive it. Um, and he's like, we'd always found that, that sweet spot. And he's like, it wouldn't be that you could taste more. The wine wasn't sweeter than, say, two grams to three grams, but it just felt more complete. Have you seen it on the sugar side as higher is always better, even if they can't perceive it? Or is it like, is it always in balance working with, you know, the other components, as we kind of traditionally say? I would lean toward balance. Definitely balance. People like a little bit of sugar. Um, generally, it, it can't be cloying, right? Um, so, mm -hmm. but yeah, but I would say balance is usually key. <laughs> nice. Yeah, as as one would say, always in wine. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And I hate making generalizations like that because there's always an exception, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, you, you know, I... I feel like a lot of friends who hate sweet wines that are cloying um, and love really r kind of ripe fruited red wines mm -hmm. um, and then haven't really explored like high acid but with some residual sugar white wines. Um, and so I think that like those three, the, those three kind of categories are something that, you know, models like that would really expose. Yeah, um, yeah. This past weekend, we had we had that experience where um, I had a friend who said they I don't I, I don't like sweet wines at all because I was going to give them a dessert wine. And obviously, it was a wine that had really high acid, um, and they liked it a lot. Um, you know, the the sugar is kind of hidden by the acid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, a couple other things, Billy. I didn't know what direction you kind of wanted to go. I wanted to talk a little bit more about trends and see if we could um, lean in there. Um, what kind of do you, if you look kind of ahead to 
maybe emerging trends in terms of consumer preferences and, and or th things like these or what some producers are aiming to try and accomplish with their wines. Um, is there a clear kind of trajectory or trend in terms of what you're seeing and like has that changed since you first got into the wine industry? Um, I, I would say it's not super clear. It gets very like specific skew level for us. Uh, so like what we're really good at is identifying, okay, these are the things that exist in the market and it's hitting the consumers and they like it this much, but this is what's missing. There's a missing gap here that could cater to people and this product doesn't exist yet, right? Um, so it, 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 we, we, could, we could look at potential trends or what, rather like predict them if we had enough simulations for that. Um, but I would have to say there's more than taste when it comes to trends. Like there mm -hmm. may more variables like marketing um, is a big component of trends. Um, and we're, we're looking at how do, how does marketing affect how much people like a product, but, um, you know, we're, we're getting there. Uh, so, uh, like the low alcohol yeah, yeah, the category. Yeah. I like said the example of the wine that you described where they put the same wine in, uh, two different bottles with different labels like that, you know, I feel like really resonates with me as someone who probably used to buy wine based off labels and probably still do, you know what I mean? <laughs> Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, are, what are you drinking personally these days? Um, do you drink a lot of wine or are you too deep into it that you just, you just, uh, you can't anymore? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm sitting here with 20 glasses of wine and saying I'm working. Um, <laughs> um, I have weird. Um, I mean, I, and I ended up in Bordeaux and Burgundy, like they joke about you have enough wine, you end up in Burgundy. Definitely something I like to have with duck fat fries. Um, something unusual is um, I do like Brut Nature sparklings. Um, and people in the company call me Bubbles because my go-to drink is usually a sharp sparkling wine. Nice, nice. Are you still um, based in San Luis Obispo? Yeah, that that's way? our home base. Mm -hmm. Come on nice. over if was... you ever want to have some wine. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I definitely, uh, I actually went there for, I, number one, I had no, I'm, I moved to California almost five years ago, so I had no idea where Cal Poly was, and we went up to spend the weekend a couple weeks ago in San Luis Obispo, and I had no idea how, how interesting of a town, a nice little town it was. Like, we'd always gone up to Paso, like I said before, I worked with people who owned vineyards in Paso and Monterey and never made my way down. Um, but it was cool. They have that, there's like a little champagne shop there. We stopped by it's, I, I'm not going to try to describe it, but I'm sure, you know, um, but that's, that's interesting. Cause now I think of San Luis Obispo and the sparkling wine I had there. So yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a happy place nice. to be. Yeah. Tons well, of energy. Um, I when circling back real quick though, or have you found yourself working with, any producers and then like starting any any rivalries is there anybody who's like aha like i knew these these wines from this area were way better and like people making like either personal changes or like even business decisions like we're going to focus more now on paso fruit than like napa where we were searching before and like the boss is like i knew it we should have always gone the the better value route anyway and it's better fruit yeah i yeah definitely we our data has affected very very big business decisions. Um, and it, it's not always about management making that decision sometimes. I mean, actually more often than not, it's supporting what the winemaker is trying to convince the business of. So like one case, we had a winemaker who said this wine should not be more sweet. And the business was the owners were like pressuring him. And he pulled out taste tree data and said, actually, we're going to lose 18% of our customer base if we increase the sugar by this much. And ownership was like, oh, okay, never mind. Um, and you know, in another case, a winemaker's um, label wasn't doing really well, um, and sales was, you know, telling him to change the wine. And our data show, and he kept saying, you're selling it in the wrong category. It's too the quality is not correct for the price point. It needs to be in a higher price point. And you know, sales is hesitant to raise the price of what they're selling. But our data showed that the predicted price of his wine was much higher than what they were charging for it. 
And that data con uh, convinced sales and management to change the price and the repeat sales went through the roof. So wow. there, there had decisions like that have been, um, I mean, having a piece of paper with data that is, you know, reassuring is definitely accelerating like big decisions, I feel like. Oh yeah, I've, I've been on the other side of multiple of those decisions where it's like you try to cobble together what you think, but in the, in the end, it's really just based on like comparisons and general ideas. Like you have no ideas. I think that would be, that would have been super helpful. Um, has, has, and I guess going back to your own personal preferences, has any of the data informed your like moving anywhere to your tasting or anybody on your teams? Like I never would have thought to try this wine. I did now. And I actually kind of like it. Yeah, um, I remember having a moment, uh, so I used to make generalizations like, oh, I don't like Zins, right? Just not my thing, um, didn't want to fall into that trap, but um, the AI is actually really good at identifying any varietal you might like, whether or not it's your typical go-to style. There's going to be a wine you like that is not in your style. Um, it's very good at that. So. Uh, I, I do like having experts or like people who drink a lot of wine engage in this um, because they're they're more open minded about trying a you know variety of things. I just want customers to kind of get out of that mindset like oh I'm a pinot drink pinot drinker or I'm a cab drinker right um, yeah so yes in short <laughs> nice now oh, that's exciting I'm I'm gonna start using. Cause I'm the opposite. I like to just drink everything regardless if like, if, especially if I've never had it just to try and try and try, but I need to convince other people to do the same. So now I'll just start pointing to taste street data, data every time I need to, and just be like, see, I knew you would like it. <laughs> exactly. We're complex thanks, just thanks like so wine. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I wish I had something like this to whip out too uh, with my friends. Um, we could, I feel like you could start a pretty cool like uh, wine society or wine club kind of around um, like some of these data points and stuff and exploring wine with people together. But um, thanks so much for sharing and, and for coming on to uh, talk about Tastry and to, to talk about the industry overall. I think what you guys are doing is really neat, um, both for consumers and for producers. Sounds like adding a lot of value, which I think is great for everyone. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for the awesome conversation. This has been fun. Yeah, we'll we'll talk to you again, hopefully sometime soon, and make sure you send over uh, those uh, um, the uh, uh, score. What is yeah, it yeah, called? No. What, what do you call it? A test? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna call it a scorecard, but <laughs> um, I would just say I'll say quiz, but that's not even accurate, right? Because that means there's a right or wrong answer. I want to do well. Survey, <laughs> survey is what we call it. That's what it is. Survey. Yeah. Yeah, send that over and Billy and I will take it and maybe we'll talk about um, on our next episode. But we really appreciate having you and uh, we'll talk to you again soon, okay? All right. Have a good one. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular as amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.